Jen Bradley, uh, County Sheriff Brian Lamb, the County Commissioners, uh, Anthony Adams, Lance Lamb, Henry McCray, Lisa Walker, Ernest Jones, uh, and then Superintendent of Schools, Robert Edwards. And so we're really excited everyone's coming. Before we talk about today's announcement, would just like to say you know, they just did another report on inflation and what's going on with our economy. And some people are trying to spin it that it went down a little bit over last month. The problem is uh, it came in higher than expected. And if you look at really what went down in, in April was some of the energy, and a lot of that is because China was locking their citizens down, so they weren't using as much. What have we seen with energy in May already? It's going back up. And we're not even in summer driving season yet. And so I, I think it was a really, really destructive report. Uh, you know, in Florida, we actually guard people's money well. We don't print money that we don't have. We spend reasonably. And the result is you know, we have the biggest budget surplus we've ever had in the history of the state right now. And so... And we have no income tax. Uh, we have the lowest per capita tax burden uh, in the country. And even though we have better roads, services, schools, and universities than a state like New York, which has 3 million fewer people than us, their budget's over twice the size of our budget. You know, where does all that money go? Uh, so we're doing it right. Uh, we're protecting taxpayers. People obviously have been able to keep their businesses open, jobs, all that stuff, very important. But if you look in Washington, they've printed trillions of dollars, and they just keep printing this money. What do you think is going to happen? Everyone was warning about this uh, when they did it uh, last year, 10 or 12, 15 months ago, and they've continued to do it. And so here's the problem is that people's wages, real wages, are going down when you have this type of inflation. You could end up getting a 7% pay increase nominally, but if everything costs eight, nine, ten percent uh, more than you've lost ground. And the way they calculate this inflation, a lot of the stuff that really matters has gone up way more than eight uh, percent. So you look uh, year over year, fuel is like 45 percent. You look at some of the gas utilities, that's gone up. You look at uh, groceries and how much it costs now for, for food. All these things are going up, and these are uh, expenses that, that people, you know, it, it's hard not to pay for gas if you got to get to work. It's hard not to put food on. I mean, you, 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 need, you need to do all these things. So it's really, uh, I think, being uh, having a really negative impact. Now, because of that and because a lot of the mismanagement, you know, it's very possible uh, that we see Biden plunge this country into a recession. And I hope that's not true. You know, what we've done in Florida, though, is say we can't control what's going on in D.C. All we can control is here. And so you know, we've done really well. A lot of opportunities in this state. Obviously, when these other states were closed and we were open, it made it a lot easier for us to, to gain ground. So we were doing that and we were happy to do it. Uh, but if there is a downturn, one, I think our economy is just better positioned to, to, to weather it than some other states are. But if we have a slowdown in revenue because of some of the things that D.C. is going, because we have such a big surplus, I don't miss a beat on anything the state's doing. We just take some money from the reserve and we just put it into the budget. And so all the stuff that we've been working so hard on, public safety, education, all those things, all that will continue because we've planned ahead and we understand that sometimes uh, these things happen. I hope it doesn't happen. I really do. Uh, but I can't think of a stretch where we've had so many misguided policies that have been implemented really across the board. And so while we're prepared, uh, I think it's prudent to prepare for things like that. And then if it doesn't happen, you're fine. But if you don't prepare and then something like that happens, then you can be in a difficult situation. So I was disappointed to see that report today. Uh, there's really not really an end in sight the way it's going. And I'm very concerned about the energy this summer because the gas, I've not seen it under $4 in Florida for unleaded in a long time. 
And we actually, and it's, it's, it's even higher than just $4 here, but we are on the lower end of prices nationally because our taxes are lower than some of these other places. There's a lot of other states that have been above $5 a gallon for unleaded for the last uh, however many couple months. California is like six something dollars because they tax it so much. And so, you know, this is a huge problem and I am concerned about what would happen this summer as more people are driving because that's just what, hap what happens every summer. We need to start doing more domestic energy production like we were doing prior to this administration. We have Keystone, Anwar, all the, you know, they say that you can now apply for lease on federal lands, but these companies know they're never going to get permitted for it. So why are they going to go through all this? Because they know that really the government doesn't want them to be able to do this. So you end up in a situation where we're basically stepping on our own neck as a country uh, by not being energy independent. You're begging OPEC to lower the price. You're begging Maduro from Venezuela maybe to give us some of his oil. How does it work? Our oil causes global warming, but Maduro's doesn't cause global warming? I mean, how does that make sense to anybody? Uh, so the number one thing he could do to help with the inflation is to expand our own energy production. And, and that would be a huge relief for all. You know, we, we did a big tax cut uh, last Friday. I signed in the law. You know, we don't have an income tax, so we can't cut tax rates, but we try to provide relief. So there's a fuel holiday. There's back to school holidays. There's a, a, a tools and, and handyman type stuff for both for people in business and around your house. We did a one year holiday on uh, diapers and, and baby, um, baby clothing uh, starting July 1st, which I know, look, we have a two-year-old at home. That's going to help us. It honestly wasn't my idea. My wife was like, why didn't you do this when the first year you became governor when we had more kids in diapers? But, you know, so I give credit to the legislature on that. We did stuff for home improvements, all this stuff, and we're happy to do that, um, and we're happy to be able to provide relief for people. But, man, uh, you know, you can sit there and, 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 and do some of this stuff, if you just got serious about the energy, you know, that would be a huge difference. Because if we were serious about energy, you know, you wouldn't have 430 a gallon gas. You know, it may have gone up a little bit with general inflation, you know, but we'd probably be like 250 a gallon if we were just doing what we could. And so uh, I, I, I hope that they'll reverse course on that, but I don't think that they will. The other thing I think that's really uh, significant that's happened over the last couple of weeks is federal government's now created within the Department of Homeland Security, a disinformation bureau, where the government is gonna tell us what is true, and then what we wanna say, they're gonna say is disinformation. And they're gonna try to marginalize people who dissent from their orthodoxy. Uh, they are gonna try to uh, get people uh, canceled if you uh, dissent from their orthodoxy. And just think how this has played out over the last two years. Federal government, CDC, Fauci, whoever would say, if you get COVID, you do not get natural immunity. And we know that was not true then. And I would say, guys like me would say, actually, if you recovered from COVID, you have protection. Um, but they denied the existence of natural immunity and really to the, to the huge detriment of the credibility of all these uh, government agencies like the CDC. Because like when you're denying things that are scientific facts that are obvious based on the data just because it suits your political agenda, uh, people see that and then they don't trust you um, in the future. And so they did things like that. When I was saying kids needed to be in school, some of these media outlets were saying that's disinformation that the kids shouldn't be in school, even though we had seen kids be in school in places like Sweden and other parts of the world. Uh, and it, it was obvious that that was the, the evidence based thing to do. Now they say kids need to be in school. But when you when I was saying that two years ago, that was considered disinformation. And so what they're doing is not trying to identify truth. What they are trying to do is elevate their own political narratives. Uh, and they're trying when people speak the truth to, because if you are speaking the truth, you don't really care what people say because folks are going to see it's true. You're only worried about the dissent uh, when you know the emperor has no clothes. And so the narratives that they're trying to sell us uh, are not credible narratives. And so when people like us want to speak out against that, they want to find ways to marginalize. And so people say, and then they put this this person in, in, in charge of it who is just totally off her rocker. 
she has engaged in misinformation. She has talked about things like Russia collusion and advocated for coronavirus lockdowns and all these other things. And so if you did a caricature about somebody that you would want to put in there to like scare people into saying this is a bad idea, I couldn't, I couldn't draw up anyone any better. So it's really, really troubling. But here's, I think, what they're going to do with it. They know that they couldn't get away with actually enforcing that against us directly from the government. I mean, it would be unconstitutional flatly, and um, they would suffer a lot politically from even trying to do it. But what I think they're going to do is they are going to determine what is acceptable, what is, quote, disinformation, and they are going to expect the social media companies to do their dirty work. And so if they, this bureau identifies something as disinformation, the expectation is Google and Facebook and Twitter until Musk gets a hold of it, that they're going to have to then go and do it. And first of all, that's wrong. You can't subcontract out to private companies violations of our Constitution. And so in Florida, we're going to make sure uh, that, that we'll be fighting back against that if they do it. You know, they say these, these, uh, these tech companies are private and that therefore not subject to First Amendment uh, First Amendment protections for people, and first, and that isn't even true, and, and that's debatable. We just had our uh, big tech censorship law. We passed a bill in 2021 to protect Floridians against big tech censorship. Big tech sued. Uh, they had the most expensive lawyers on the whole God's green earth came in to sue on this. They got an injunction from a, from a liberal judge, which we knew would happen. We just did the argument last week on appeal in the 11th Circuit. And honestly, the judges understood that w what Florida was trying to do. So we don't know how that decision is going to come out, but I'm cautiously optimistic that we were going to get uh, significant portions of that law upheld in court. And then that will really be the start of the states fighting back against some of the stuff that big tech has done. But when you are doing the government's business bidding as a private corporation, then you are subjected to First Amendment protections for, uh, for people. If Fauci is telling you to, to censor or the DHS Disinformation Bureau is telling you to censor and you are doing it at their behest, then you are not treated as a private company and you must abide by the First Amendment. And so we're looking at that. Uh, we're going to see what they do with this. I mean, if they were smart, they'd just disband this agency because it was a terrible idea to begin with. But I do think this is part and parcel of a movement, particularly amongst these folks in Washington, uh, to just try to say there's only one accepted viewpoint. And if you dissent from that viewpoint, you know, you need to be marginalized, deplatform, or censored. And so our job in Florida uh, is to stand up for folks' uh, right to speak out and to talk about uh, the things that are going wrong and to poke holes in some of these ridiculous, phony narratives uh, that they're trying to shove down our throats. And so stay tuned on that. We're going to make sure uh, that we're doing a lot. Also, just like to say thank you to everybody here who has prayed for my wife over these last many months. Uh, we were able to, um, uh, she, she actually came out and, and was able to give a, a, a part of a speech on, uh, I guess it was Monday night. We were down in the villages. You know, they had this DeSantis Day dinner. So, you know, so I go up to speak, but I'm like, you know, you didn't say which one. Is it me or is it her? Because quite frankly, more people want to hear her than me. And so, um, so she was able to come out and, and offer some thanks to everybody for, uh, for the prayers. I tell you, when you go through something like this, look, all I'm trying to do is be supportive and be positive. Uh, when it's you that it has, it's tough. I mean, it, 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 it takes a toll mentally because you just don't know when something like that happens. And I can tell you when we kind of first got the news, trying to figure out what we were going to do, you know, it was really, really rough for her. And then when we announced it publicly, and we, we just figured, look, she's a public person. It is private, but at the same time, people just uh, – we just want people to know she's not out there as much. That's why. Um, once that happened, everyone started praying for her. And I can tell you, it made a difference. Um, she was so, um, uh, I think, lifted up by everybody's uh, thoughts and prayers. And that's really never stopped. I mean, people, people pray for her all the time. And so uh, she's doing really, really well. And I'll tell you, she has really served by coming out publicly. She's served as an inspiration for a lot of other women that are now going through this. And they say, you know, if, she's, if she got, went through it and is able to do it, then I know I can do it. And that's the thing. I mean, having been there through this just as a spouse is, 
you know, for, for, for women out there, you can beat this. I mean, they've got good medicine, and it's not an easy thing. It's not, not very fun to go through, for sure. Uh, but there is absolutely a light at the end of the tunnel, and I think my wife is proof of that. So thank you, guys. So we are very proud in Florida of our rural communities. Uh, I think that uh, we've uh, been able to do an awful lot. Some of it was just we were called upon when I first became governor with Hurricane Michael. Uh, you know, we had a lot of rural communities in northwest Florida. I mean, that thing was a buzzsaw. It's a Category 5 storm. It really was more almost like a tornado, uh, more so than even a typical uh, tropical uh, type system. And it really left a lot of destruction. And so we've worked really hard to help lift those communities up. And we've really just never stopped. And our view is, is, you know, providing the infrastructure that's necessary, particularly for counties that are more fiscally constrained, is something that we want to do. So today, we continue along the lines uh, of that mission that we really started from the first day I was a, a, as governor. Uh, so we're here um, being able to announce some great stuff uh, for our county here. Uh, $7 million dollars are included in the budget. Now, I haven't signed the budget yet. We're going through it. There's a lot of individual things. You gotta go, you gotta vet. They wanna give $500,000 to some group. I need to figure out whether that's something that's right. So we have to do a lot of research on all the stuff that we're doing. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff in there uh, for Lafayette County. And so here are the things that I can announce today we have approved in the budget and will be coming right here. 500,000 for the Sheriff's Office communications radios to be updated. <laughs> Almost 300,000 for pay raises for our Sheriff's deputies right here in Lafayette County. And that's in addition to, you know, this current year budget because we were, we did the budget in 2020, the spring of 2021, and you saw a lot of communities around the country slashing funding for law enforcement and attacking law enforcement. So we said, you know what? While they're defunding law enforcement, we're going to fund and then some. So this current year, all deputies, uh, municipal, county, and state uh, sworn law enforcement officers got a $1,000 bonus uh, from the state of Florida. And we're doing it in this next budget. That is in there again. So for the second year in a row, we are going to be able to deliver $1,000 bonuses for not just our, our law enforcement, but also our firefighters. And so we thank them for their service. We have another $4.5 million for road resurfacing in the county. <laughs> We have another $400,000 for security uh, for the public school system here. And we got almost three quarters of a million dollars for maintenance and repairs at three state parks um, in this area. And so we think that this will have uh, big positive impacts uh, on the safety uh, of our residents here and also the visitors uh, that come. So that's one announcement. The other announcement is I am announcing my commitment to approve $30 million in the budget for the Rural Infrastructure Fund for the state of Florida. So the Department of Economic Opportunity administers this. It provides resources to support uh, rural communities by improving infrastructure and by expanding the local workforce. Um, you know, you look, these are great communities where people can do more manufacturing, all this great stuff. So we want to make sure that we're doing our part at the state level uh, to help with that. Additionally, I'm announcing that we're approving over $400 million for the Broadband Opportunity Program. So this new program will support underserved communities with a focus on connectivity for rural communities to build broadband infrastructure for their residents. And so we think that this will support not only workforce uh, in the economy, but also education. And so that will be parceled out amongst a number of areas, rural communities. Uh, and so it's not limited to this county, of course, but it'll be throughout the state. It's interesting, when you look at some of the broadband places that, that there's gaps, there's actually some counties, you know, that are pretty big landmass 
that have a lot of population, but they don't have it necessarily evenly divided around. So there'll be parts of some of our larger counties that will also benefit from this. So we're really excited about it. Uh, I think that um, I think we've probably done more as governor to make sure that, that we were paying attention to rural Florida, uh, you know, more than any other governor. We're, we're really proud of that, and we're proud of the folks uh, that, that, that live in all these great communities. And so we're going to hear from some other folks uh, coming up here in just a minute. So we're going to start uh, with the sheriff. Uh, then we're going to have uh, Senator Jen Bradley. Did Schof come? Is he here? Okay. Representative Jason Schof was going to get a chance to say something, but uh, he didn't ever make it. And then we'll have Dane Eagle come, and we'll be able to, um, uh, to, to, to do that. All right, so Sheriff, come on up. Uh, just thank you, Governor. Isn't it great to have a governor that loves Lafayette County like we love Lafayette County? A governor that cares about our school system, which is our future of the you know with the kids and their education. Um, it, it, it's just great. Uh, I, I'm almost speechless when he went to uh, naming out the amount of funding that he uh, was <laughs> assisting us. Because a lot of a lot of people don't understand, it's hard for us to generate the the amount of revenue that we have to use, and whether it's our school system or you know the county or our law enforcement first responders. But when you have a governor that truly cares, even about Lafayette County, which we're one of the smallest in the state, that's great. And and he today he shows how much he cares about us and how much he loves us. Um, And we have a governor who funds law enforcement, you know, yeah. defunding, you know. We have a, and we have a governor who recognizes that law enforcement, public safety is important. And we have to have safe communities to have safe living and safe businesses. And so when we have a governor that does what he's done for us in this short of amount of time, I just, I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I know all y'all do too. Um, so again, governor, thank you. Um, we, we greatly appreciate it. And by your contributions, you're going to make our county a safer place to live and work and just it's it's amazing. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Of course, of course. Okay, we have State Senator Jen Bradley. Okay. Good morning. Isn't it wonderful to have Flor to have America's governor in God's country? That's right. Florida has never had a governor that has a heart for rural Florida like Governor DeSantis. He doesn't just talk about it, he shows up in every rural county. And the reason these resources are here for us to be able to appropriate and for the governor to be able to appropriate is because of the policies and the leadership of Governor DeSantis since he took office. Keeping Florida open, getting our economy going. Our economy is the envy of the nation. And it's because of the leadership of Governor DeSantis and having Florida free. And to have those funds to support public education, law enforcement, our beautiful natural resources, that's what's important to us here in rural Florida. I couldn't be prouder to represent you, and I couldn't be prouder of our governor. How many counties do you have in your district? Yeah, a lot. I mean, like, like a lot. Like we do all the all, all our rural, and, and Jen is there. So um, it's great, though. I mean, these are these are great communities. Okay, Dane Eagle. <laughs> well, uh, thanks to the governor, and despite the inflation going at the federal level, Florida's economy has been leading the nation. We are outpacing in job growth, outpacing in workforce. We have more jobs 
and uh, workers here than we did pre-pandemic. That's amazing. We're consistently below the national average in unemployment. But even while we continue to lead the nation in economic growth, the governor has charged his entire administration with not leaving the rural communities behind. He's consistently said, do not forget them. What else can we do? And by name, he's asked us to, he charged us at DEO with helping out Lafayette County. So our team's been talking with uh, the county leaders, firstly talked with Sheriff Lamb. He expressed how important some of the budget items were, which is why the governor is so happy to, to, to uh, announce those today. Uh, and then even more importantly, some of the things we can do in the future, broadband, 400 million that the governor just committed to. That is incredible. And we're gonna be unleashing that a across the state. I read a statistic recently that uh, Lafayette County has 4% uh, of households have adequate uh, internet. I don't know if that's true, but who here thinks they should have better internet? Okay, so that's telling. I encourage all of you today when you get home or from your cell phones or at work, go to floridajobs.org slash broadband. You can do a speed test. We're not tracking you. Zuckerberg's not going to know about it. But that's going to allow us to help pinpoint where we can do better and where we can unleash some of these grants. And then $30 million for Rural Infrastructure Fund. Historically, that's been $5 million a year. But the governor challenged the legislature, and I know Senator Bradley was eager to, to meet that challenge and try to do better. $30 million this year. So those are grants we can work on, and we'll continue to work with your county to do so. Thank you, Governor DeSantis. All right. Good deal. You know, I also forgot to mention we've done more in Florida uh, to ensure good, free, strong elections with a lot of integrity measures to make sure that, that our votes are counted uh, and that everything is fair. And so if you look at what we've done on election integrity, we've done more than anybody in the country. We did um, in Florida now, if you ballot harvest, that's a third degree felony in the state of Florida. We're not gonna allow ballot harvesting. Um, <laughs> We're going to make sure, yes, if you go in to vote, voter ID, then if you request an absentee ballot, you also need to do uh, ID so that we make sure that these, uh, these mail ballots are, are going to who requested them. And there, there's no ability in Florida now to just send mail ballots to whoever you want to like they do in California. They'll send them in California. People haven't lived there ten, for 10 years, and they'll get a mail ballot you know, halfway across the country. That is, uh, that is not acceptable. So we don't do that um, in the state of Florida. Uh, we also, and, and maybe this is one of the most important things we've done, we banned Zuckerbucks in Florida. And so Zuckerberg from Facebook, he did $420 million into these nonprofit groups and the nonprofits would go into key areas in terms of the election, and they would basically commandeer the elections office. They would give millions of dollars. They'd bring in their people. They would do big ballot harvesting and mail ballot operations. And um, that's wrong to have a private tech mogul uh, basically commandeer the actual machinery of the elections. And so he said now he's not going to do this in 2022 because he's getting a lot of scrutiny on it. Uh, but from Florida's perspective, it doesn't matter what he wants to do. He is not allowed to do that in Florida, uh, and there's not going to be any Zuckerbucks. We also believe, you know, you go in to vote. It's a secret ballot. Obviously, go in in person. Uh, we do have absentee requests. You can request a ballot. You can, of course, mail that in. Uh, but if you want to hand deliver it, uh, we're not going to just have these drop boxes in the middle of a street corner that nobody's watching and someone could dump ballots. So what you're going to do, you can go into the election sites during the voting hours and you can, you can hand it in. Um, and so there's no more of these drop boxes uh, permitted um, in the state of Florida. And it's just... It's not, it's not good policy to have that, and we've seen it, I think, be abused in other states. And then to be able to ensure that we're following the law and enforcing the law, we created this year first ever election integrity unit in state government. And so their sole function is to investigate and prosecute violations of election law. And so we are going to be in really good shape. Um, your vote is absolutely going to count. Everyone should feel confident of that. But we had some of these provisions were challenged in court, uh, in, in district court uh, uh, last year, but it went into this year. And they were, some of them were minor provisions, but the Dropbox one and a couple others, you had this judge say that it was like, it was unconstitutional or violated the law or all this stuff. And the media made such a big deal about it. They were so happy you know, to see that the judge, and the judge rules against us every time. We know how this works. Um, and so they were so happy about that. And then what happened? 
you just had the appeals court three to nothing say actually florida can go ahead with these provisions in the law you didn't hear the media talk about that one as much but i can tell you we knew that that decision wouldn't stand we've already got the initial decision but i think we'll even get more uh... even better decisions as this as this goes on in the future but for twenty twenty two all the election integrity that we have done in the state of florida in law uh... is implemented and will will be a part of of what the elections look like and so that's a really really good thing and we've been able to to get beyond um, you know some of the stuff where some of these guys are just activists where they're going to rule for political reasons and they have a, an ulterior agenda so that's why it's important you have good people on these appeals courts who can exercise some adult supervision and i think that's what's happened here and uh, we're we're happy about that so okay well can i do anything else for anybody is what else do you need yes Yeah, well, I think we did, we're actually doing a lot in the uh, overall budget, which will affect here and elsewhere. One of the things we're doing is, you know, you have folks that are tending to elderly, and there's a massive shortage of just getting enough people to be able to do. And this is across a variety of different things, nursing homes, other stuff. Uh, so we've had huge increases in the ability to, to pay the people who are going in and doing these positions. That's going to be able to retain more people. Uh, and it's going to be able to help recruit more people. And so we put a lot of money into that. Um, and you look at some of the stuff with some of the Medicaid rates that, that we increase uh, to be able to address uh, some of these issues. We've also put a lot of money generally, and we'll make some announcements specifically about some of the stuff we're doing, about being able to produce more nurses in the state of Florida. It's been a massive nursing shortage. Now, part of it, what happened with COVID was – you had these areas would say, okay, we're going to have a surge in hospital, and so they would want to hire additional nurses. And so these nurses could make way more as a contract nurse than actually working for the hospital. So you would have nurses in, in communities really throughout the country who were working for a hospital. They would get hired by the contractor for much more, and then they would still even work at the same hospital just for a lot. So, I mean, you obviously people are going to do that. But what happened is – uh, they can also get sent to different places, and so that's where a lot of folks have wanted to gravitate towards. So it's been harder for some of the hospitals to make sure that they have who they want. So what we're doing is you know, we're expanding nursing programs at our state colleges, and what we're trying to do with workforce is we want to be able to put people in positions where – they go through a program, they get skills, they're going to be able to succeed. And right now, if you go through and you're qualified as a nurse, you will absolutely have a job. There's no question about that. And it's important. You know, my mother was a nurse for over 40 years. And so uh, it's just something that, that we want to make sure we're doing well. But it absolutely affects patient care. You know, certainly affects um, our elderly population. And so you're going to see probably the biggest expansion of, of efforts to uh, train and produce more nurses than we've ever had in the state of Florida. And it also kind of raises a larger issue about uh, what is the education system all about? And yes, part of the school system is to be able to make kids prepared so if they want to go to university and do well. We're proud of our universities that we don't let them raise tuition. And so you go as a Florida resident, it's actually affordable. You will not need to go $100,000 in debt. In fact, with bright futures, you probably wouldn't need to go in debt at all in most situations. Uh, so that's very important because you get a degree, but if you're 120, 130000 in debt, especially if the degree's in like zombie studies, well, then what are you going to do? You're going to end up in a job you could have had out of high school. And so that's not what we want. Um, now, look, if you go $100,000 in debt and you end up with a, a degree in engineering from MIT or something, you're probably going to be okay, okay? You're going to be in very high demand. So I'm not in any way saying don't do some of even the pricier colleges, but just understand that right now uh, a four-year brick and ivy university is not the only way you can be successful, and it's not even the best way for many people. And so we're working to give folks opportunities to get concrete skills in, in the trades and in other types of, of career uh, vocations where they will make good money right off the bat. I mean, we've expanded the ability to produce more truck drivers in Florida. Walmart will pay $110,000 a year to start as a truck driver. 
Uh, you look now, there's companies in Florida who pay you a $15,000 signing bonus to start as a truck driver. You look what they're paying for people who have certifications in electric or HVAC or all these other things, and you are making good money without being in debt. And the thing is, a lot of these young people, as they get, gain a little experience, they can start their own companies in a lot of these communities. You know, when a, a community like a state like Florida is growing, uh, there's going to be a need for more of all these services, especially, you know, I think back like the World War II generation, they would fix everything around their houses. You know, if something happened, they, well, now the younger generation doesn't necessarily do that. That's just not what they've been taught to do. So if they have problem with AC, if they have, they have to call people in to be able to do it. So there's a huge demand uh, for these types of services. So we just want to make sure that we're letting kids know that, that these are viable options. You're not any worse than anyone because you didn't go to a four-year university. And in fact, if someone's going to a four-year university and racks up a bunch of debt for a worthless degree, you're probably smarter that you chose a different path. And so what we want people to be prepared to do what they follow their dreams. Uh, but I felt like when I was a kid growing up, people would really say, you know, college is the only way to succeed. And that was really drilled in, I think, to my generation and some of the people that are younger than me. And I think the result has been not great in terms of the amount of student debt that's out there and the amount of number of college graduates who are underemployed uh, in our economy from what a college degree was supposed to do. So we had a goal when I became governor, make Florida number one for workforce education. We were in the bottom half of states. Uh, I don't know where we are now, but we've gone up a lot. Um, in the, uh, in the three, three plus years I've been governor and we're well on our way to doing that. Not only does it give students more opportunities to be able to uh, have uh, good careers, it helps us with business development. Because if I have someone that wants to bring production to Florida and they know that we're taking these skills seriously, well they know they're gonna have a pool of people that are gonna be able to fill these spots. And that's a huge, huge thing. And so the number of uh, business people that I've talked to who are in manufacturing and logistics and some of these really key industries, when I start talking about that, they say, you know, no one else is doing that uh, in, in the country, what Florida's doing. More people need to know about it, but, but we really support uh, that, and I think that that's going to that, – that, that, those investments will, will pay for themselves uh, over and over again, you know, over the many, many years. So, okay, well, it's been great to be here. I thank you all, uh, and we'll see you back soon. Okay. Yeah.